But before we dive into 1 Timothy 6 and looking at these six attributes um, that Paul calls us to pursue, anybody know this last attribute today that we're looking at? Gentleness. Someone's reading. Yes. What, what would you guys say gentleness is? How would you define gentleness? Just raise your hand. I want to get a, a, just an off-the-cuff thought. Maybe a different adjective. What would you, kindness. Okay. Gentleness. Yes. Slow to anger. Slow to anger. Okay. Sensitive. Sensitive. Concern. Concern for other people. That's good. Yeah. Long suffering. Long suffering. It's probably... Yes, 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 and amen. It's probably one of those things out of all the world. ones like, think about studying faith. Yes, righteousness. Yes, gentleness. That's for the women. <laughs> well, that's all, all too often. We don't really understand the biblical definition of gentleness. And so today, you're going to come away with a much deeper understanding of why the Apostle Paul, <clears throat> who was a strong man of God, said for us to pursue Gentleness. Take a look at this video. you, O man of God, pursue these things. And the last thing the Apostle Paul says to pursue is gentleness. Gentleness, according to the scriptures, has a clear definition. Power under control. So often we'll hear the word gentleness and we'll think soft, kind, quiet. Gentle does not mean soft or even kind or quiet. It means strength. It means the hardest demonstrated strength of God. In other words, you'll see in scripture for gentleness is meekness. The meek shall inherit the earth. Matter of fact, when I think of the word meekness, I think of Moses. In Numbers 12, the scripture says that Moses was the meekest man in all the earth. I used to read that in NIV where it says Moses was the most humble man in all the earth. After all, he said so. 
The better word is meek. Power under control. Harnessed power. That incredible word meekness. What does that look like? What does it look like to have power under control that's gentle? When I think of meekness, I think of Jesus. If you want to think of gentleness, think of Jesus. The way that he loved. Was Jesus meek and gentle when he looked at the Pharisees and said, your dad is the devil? Was Jesus gentle and meek when he looked at his disciples and says, ye of little faith? See, what gentleness is, it's a display of God's power that meets the need and is motivated by love. But it doesn't always feel pleasant. When God spoke to Elijah in the cave, he spoke to him through a gentle whisper, but he also spoke to him through a strong wind that broke the mountains and the rocks. Which was gentle? Both. They're both gentle. I mean, God's power, his voice could just vaporize the earth. So I would say a voice that just split the mountains was pretty doggone gentle. Doesn't mean that he felt that way about it. But see, God's motivation in the exercise of his power was not to push someone, but to help someone. That's the purpose of gentleness. It's not something that's soft. It's something that is strong. And it's something that is done that's motivated in love. It was Wednesday evening. I was at the Levite's love feast that we had over at Myra's, Scott Myra's house and Kareen brought her week and a half old baby and Anastasia which means resurrection and I got to sit there and hold Anastasia and feed her a bottle and just look at her and oh my gosh I can just remember just taking her and holding her head and and, and just caressing her and just looking at her and, and even the tones I would use and talk with her, I was being meek. The way that I would hold her or I would go up to my brother and give him a hug, two very different things. To pursue gentleness or meekness is the sensitivity to the heart of God and how to display the power, the influence, the knowledge that God has given us as men. And it's important that we pursue that daily. It's really, honestly, how love is manifested. How do we manifest love? With harnessed power. Matter of fact, the book of Galatians, you know the passage, chapter 5, verse 22, it says, The fruit of the Spirit is love. And know this, there is only one fruit. It doesn't say fruits, plural, of the Holy Spirit. There's only one fruit, and that is the love of God, but it's manifested in joy, peace, long-suffering, or patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. And then one verse puts these two together that are somewhat synonymous, gentleness and self-control. That if we're going to love, whether it's a week and a half old baby or a 35-year-old man that we're shaking his hand and giving him a hug, there's a different expression and harnessing and control of power. Are you with me, brothers? This is what the Apostle Paul is saying is vital and must be pursued. We could even say last, but definitely not least of the attributes that he speaks to young Timothy about. When I thought of this exhortation, I thought of a quote from a Dutch reformer by the name of Bethune in 1839, George Bethune, listen to this. There may be no grace less prayed for or cultivated than that of gentleness and self-control. Wow. Here, 184 years later, I would say that still stands as true, wouldn't you? As I mentioned earlier, when I looked at those attributes, gentleness was the least attractive to me to teach on. I said, I'll have Norm teach on this one. He's gentle, <laughs> and, which you are in every context. But, but I thought, well, maybe, maybe, Holy Spirit, you're trying to tell your servant something about gentleness that I don't know. And, and uh, boy, he has taught me so much, even over the last couple of days, and, and showed me that, um, man, God gives me power not to direct towards people. That's abusive. It's power for people. 
That's the way Jesus displayed his power, his influence, his knowledge, his abilities. Jesus, our hero. He said in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, come to me, all you who labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Aren't you grateful that God is gentle? That he knows whether to just touch us and caress us on the head and say, you're my boy. Or whether he's got to light up our rear end and kick us in our complacency because we're stuck. Both are gentle. Both are meek. Because with him, it's always motivated in love. Always. It's not out of frustration. When he said, ye of little faith, it wasn't like, I'm personally frustrated with you guys, and you're just really getting on my nerves. Which sometimes when we display that, that male hormone in our voice and we raise it with our kids, is it love or is it frustration? Is it stress? That's not the act of a man who is strong. That's actually the act of a man who is weak. God wants us to be men of strength, but a harnessed strength with the motivation of displaying the nature of God, which is love. This is why God became man, to do that very thing. Hallelujah. Oh, man, this passage in Isaiah says it all. Isaiah 40, Behold, the Lord God shall come with a strong hand, and his arms shall rule for him. Behold, his reward is with him, and his work before him. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. And he will gather the lambs with his arm and carry them in his bosom and gently lead those who are with young. Talk about contrast. Oh, I thought about this pic here. Look at this. This kind of picture worth a thousand words. Here we go. The lion and the lamb. It's just like he's able to be both according to the need for our soul, putting our welfare beyond his own. That's what love does, man. When Paul says he wants us to pursue this, he's wanting us to pursue the ability to have God's perspective. When he gives us a gift, he wants us to use it to display his heart, not to control the narrative. Too often, we use the platform, the power, the influence, the knowledge, and we use it to control the narrative to play God because we have power and control issues, right? Man, aren't you so glad God doesn't have power and control issues? Isn't that ironic? Him who has all power and authority laid down power and authority because he loved us. Amen. I'm grateful. That's meek. That's gentle. And that's lowly. Paul tells us to pursue this incredible supernatural ability because he found it redeeming and attractive and godly to walk in purity. Paul was not always that way. The Paul who tells young Timothy, who's timid and soft, he tells him that God's given us a spirit of boldness, not fear. And within that, ironically, we can be gentle and we can be bold, and we can be assertive, and we can be certain. Saul took the giftings that he had, Saul, which means destroyer. This guy, as we know scripture teaches, was a blasphemer, a persecutor, insolent. This guy was not strong, he was weak. He took the power and platform that he had, and he used it to destroy, to hurt people. Man, speaking of such a thing, I came across a news article last night. Talk about power and strength used the wrong way. I ran across this news report, and you can keep this family in prayer. This is a picture of a family of four, particularly the three-year-old that you see in the picture. Kavil Allen is his name. Kavil was being taken by his dad and his mom just a couple days ago in Brooklyn, Brooklyn Park, Missouri, to get a puppy. And as he was petting one of the puppies, 
The mother and the father, American Bulldogs, proceeded to tear him up. Tear this little boy up. Can you imagine taking your three-year-old little boy to go get his first puppy? And you take him to this suburb area, and this mother and this father begin to attack. Even the mom, as she's trying to pull the dogs off, she's had two surgeries, the third one that she's waiting on for the back of her heel that just ripped her calf apart. Little Koval right now, this picture right now, is the family laying hands on him and loving him and praying for him and saying goodbye to him because they're pretty much saying there's no hope for him and he's pretty much going to be used to donate his organs to other kids. Broke my heart when I heard this. I'm personally a dog lover. I've got an amazing dog who has a lot of ability that can be a bull in a china shop. But at my command, that dog, she is so gentle, so loving. This dog just reminded me of what the enemy wants to feed our minds with when God gives us power and authority to bind and to loose, to say things. And by the way, words do more damage even than teeth do. And when we take those and we use them the wrong way, we might think we're using them the right way. These dogs probably thought we're protecting our puppies from these kids, more than likely. But they were wrong what they were doing. I've been praying for this family that God would have grace and do a miracle and the doctors would come in and say there is hope. I would ask you to agree with me in that prayer. Amen? Yeah. But it is such a life lesson it is such a life lesson of just how power, authority, knowledge can be used to destroy when it's meant to create and it's meant to heal and it's meant to rescue in Jesus' name. Paul, Saul, I should say, was a destroyer. Like these dogs, he was using his authority. He thought he was protecting the Jewish faith. He thought he was standing for the truth of God and protecting the house of God. But he was actually destroying God's kids, and particularly Stephen. Can you imagine, like, you, you think you're doing God a service as you're stoning one of his precious sons? And yet God knew exactly in his meekness and power how to rescue Saul the destroyer and turn him into Paul the small. Paul, who had an incredible mantle of spiritual authority, but walked so abased before God and before his people. Do you know God can do that in you and me? Amen. Amen. Yes. When Paul says, hey, Timothy, pursue gentleness, pursue meekness, pursue self-mastery and the ability to harness the power of God, but do it in such a way, the way it's manifested is not for your convenience or your pleasure or your will, but for his delight. That's a shepherd you can trust. It made me think of Psalms 18 that says, you have also given me the shield of your salvation. Your right hand has held me up and your gentleness has made me great. The way, God, that I've watched you to manifest your omnipotent power the way that I've watched you do that has won my heart. It changed Saul to Paul when he writes things like this in 2 Corinthians 10, where he says, Paul, myself, I'm pleading with you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ. In his presence, I'm lowly among you, but being absent and bold towards you. But I beg you that when I am present, I may not be bold with the confidence by which I intend to be bold against some who think of us if we walked according to the flesh. Paul's like, listen, I, I, I can be very gentle and soft with you, and I would prefer to do that. But because of the meekness in Christ, if I have to come and bring the thunder, I will. What was his motivation? 
It was love. It wasn't an offense. It wasn't to say, those guys are condescending in their conversation about me compared to Cephas, Peter, or Apollos. And in the flesh, they're saying, I'm not much to look at, much to listen to. I'm not going to come in boldness and use my spiritual authority and weight and somehow because I have an offense or because I don't feel like I'm in control, I'm only going to do what's necessary for your edification. That is the motivation. Pursuing meekness, that's what that looks like. And we see this all through the epistles with this guy who was a destroyer to this guy who became a healer. Ephesians 4 says, as a prisoner of the Lord, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Philippians 4 or 5, let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. He writes to the Galatians when he says, when you have to come to a brother who has an offense, maybe he's prideful and arrogant. He's being divisive. Maybe he's living a life of adultery or fornication. There's something going on, and you need to come to him. Paul instructs in Galatians 6, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. The Apostle Paul says, listen, if you're going to come to somebody, whether you've got to use just one of those little fine hammers, one of those finish hammers for a finish nail, or whether you need a sledgehammer, come with the idea that you'll bring whatever is needed for them to experience the love of God, even if that means you're uncomfortable with it. Some of us, we're very comfortable with always bringing the sledgehammer. Others, we we don't believe in sledgehammers because we're soft. Men, we can't be soft, we need to be gentle. There's a difference. There are men out there that are ungodly who are very hard and rough and harsh. We need men of God who can be strong like Jesus in the temple who turned over the tables, hallelujah. You with me, brothers? It's about sensitivity to the design of God for the moment and how his love, power, influence, and knowledge is manifested. But the key in order to have this wisdom, here's the word, are you ready? Submission. The only way we're going to have the sensitivity to know the gauge of the needle and how we manifest this power, authority, and platform that God has given us is if we're first and foremost in submission to him. These two ideas of submission and meekness are tied together with the excitation he gives towards Titus in chapter 3, where he says, remind the people to be subject to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready, to do whatever is good, to slander no one, to be peaceable, considerate. There's a great understanding of what it means to be gentle. Considerate and always to be gentle towards everyone. King James Version, I like where it puts it, be gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. Would you say that you're meek? Would you say that you're gentle? Would, hey, would your wife say that you're meek? Would she say you're gentle? Now, I know sometimes a wife, she's like, the champagne glass, and we're like the A&W root beer mug, right? There's just a difference in sensitivity, and sometimes we can be bringing some strong wind, not a quiet whisper, some strong wind, and they're going, you're being harsh. Are you? Maybe, maybe not. It comes down to being sensitive to God's heart and going, why am I saying what I'm saying? Why am I doing what I'm doing? Because I'm supposed to be representing Jesus to her. Amen? I'm supposed to be representing his heart. That might be bringing the strong wind. Psalms 29, the voice of the Lord thunders, hallelujah. But it's for our edification, not to vent his frustration. Our gentleness and our meekness should be evident to all. The question that came to me as I read this exhortation from Paul is, how did the harnessed power of God make Paul great? How did the gentleness of Jesus 
the good shepherd who comes and carries his young with gentleness. How did it win over his heart? Let's take a look and see his story. Acts chapter 9. The scripture says in verse 1 that Saul still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. Now, stop there real quick. This word breathing in the Greek, this is the idea. Snorting like a bull. That's literally what this means. Saul was snorting like a bull. The idea is he's looking for someone that he can trample over and mull. That's not meek. That's taking everything he has in the flesh that he's given, and he wants to use it for his own agenda. It says Saul, who was snorting like a bull, ready to mull somebody, it says he went to the high priest and asked letters from him in the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found any who were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem, And as he journeyed and came near Damascus, suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. And then he fell to the ground. And he heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And he said, who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. Just so you know, a goad was basically a rod, a poke, a stick with a point on the end that you would use towards a beast or an animal. If it was going off the wrong direction or not moving right, you goad it. In other words, Jesus says, I've been goading you, Saul. I've been pricking at you because you've been taking the authority and power and influence and platform that I gave you and you're using it and you're hurting my people. You're mulling my children. What are you doing, Saul? Maybe you felt like that at home. I don't know, with your wife, kids, a brother that you were heart with and you get this prick, this goad from the Holy Spirit in your heart like, That's not why God gave you that knowledge to beat someone up with it. That's called spiritual abuse. Have you ever done that? Yeah. Paul says, oh man of God, pursue meekness. Maybe he's been goading you and you're resisting it, kicking against it. Yeah, that was exactly what Saul was doing. It says, so he, Paul, Saul, trembling, And astonished said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Then the Lord said to him, arise and go into the city and you will be told what to do. And the men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no one. And then Saul arose from the ground and when his eyes were opened, he saw no one. But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus, that would be in Syria, And he was there three days without sight and neither ate nor drank. Do you see before Saul became Paul and went from being this person who used power towards people, against people, to this man who used power for people, he had to experience submission. Now, it wasn't that he volunteered for it. The Lord knocked him off his high horse and blinded him and brought him to a place where he couldn't even lead himself to do anything. It's almost like a man having physical problems, losing his job, his wife won't listen, his kids won't listen, nothing's working out. At that point, you've been knocked after your high horse and you can either rise up and scream and yell and be abusive and some men even physically. You can take, that's the road of Saul. That's the road of Saul. The road of Paul of meekness, says, Lord, what do you want me to do? You've given me, I'm part of the Sanhedrin. I've been disciple of Abigail, an incredible hierarchy of teacher in Judaism. I, I have so much platform. I'm from the tribe of Benjamin. The pedigree I have is just upper echelon. You've given me so much. I'm giving it to you. What do you want me to do with this, Lord? How do you want me to use this power and platform and knowledge? Because you are my Lord and my God. 
Boy, doesn't it take a lot, brothers, for us to get there? What does God have to do? How long must he goad us and prick us and, and, and cause storms to come before finally we say, I'm ready to submit to you with what you've given me. I'm ready to offer it back to you. The next verse, it says, there was a certain man, a disciple of Damascus named Ananias. And to him, the Lord said in a vision, Ananias, and he said, here I am, Lord. So the Lord said to him, arise and go to the street called Straight and inquire the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. Some irony there, wouldn't you say? For behold, I love this. He is praying. How cool is that? Like God's talking to Ananias. And he's going, as I'm talking to you and having a conversation, he's having one with me at the same time. Is that encouraging? Like, like I can talk to God at the same time, so can you, and he's fully listening. I, I wish I could do that with all my kids and grandkids. I don't have that ability. But Abba can totally do that, right? That wasn't part of, that wasn't part of the plan today, but it's free. I won't charge you for that one. It's a good one, right? I like that. That's, that's highly encouraging, man. So, hey, Ananias, Saul is praying. And it says, in a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias coming and putting his hand on him so they might receive his sight. And then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man how much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. So in other words, Ananias is going, you want me to go lay hands on this guy? I want to go take my sword to what I want to go do. I want to go rebuke him. I want to get some stones together, brothers, and stone this man. He's questioning God's direction of how power, authority should be manifested. He wants to manifest, I analyze, his power and authority according to justice as he sees it. That's where abuse comes in. Now, Ananias has logic. He has Torah, the scriptures. He has other believers that would agree with him. And he would completely be wrong, wouldn't he? How about that? What a test. What a perfect part of the saga of Saul to Paul and displaying what it means to have power against people versus power for people. Instead of power from God's people against God's people, power in God's people for God's people. And only God knows how to do that. There has to be, Lord, what do you want? What do you say? And it's probably going to be many times, not always, but many times the opposite of what we think should happen. Hmm. But the Lord said to him, go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel, for I will show him many things, and he must suffer for my name's sake. And Ananias went his way and entered the house, and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, don't you love that? Brother Saul, not Brother Paul, Brother Saul, even though you've been a destroyer and you've done horrific things, You've been like a Hannibal Lecter, Freddy Krueger, all in one against men and women in the church. And yet, because God has displayed his shepherd's heart for you and his meekness towards you, I call you my brother. Powerful. Powerful. Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you came, he has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately, there's that word again, immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales and he received his sight at once and he arose and was baptized. Verse 19, and so he went and received food. He was strengthened and then Saul spent some days with the disciples in Damascus. Immediately at verse 20, he preached the Christ in the synagogues that he is the son of God. Then all who heard were amazed and said, is this not he who destroyed those who called on the name in Jerusalem 
And has he come here from that purpose so that he might bring them bound to the chief priest? But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews with dwelt in Damascus, proving that this Jesus is the Christ. Hallelujah. God can take a Saul and make him a Paul. And you notice it says, in Paul, he is strength. In other words, he is growing in strength and might and power and stature before God and before man. And what does he do that? Draw people to himself, manipulate them, control them. He points to the gospel everywhere he goes. Man, this is power under control. God gives us power. When he said to the disciples, I want you to wait in Jerusalem for power, it's supposed to be power under control, only motivated by love. And the foundation of that is a servant who says, what do you want, Lord? How do you want to represent your heart to this person that you've privileged me to represent you to? Is it through a still small voice? Is it through a rushing wind? Is it the sledgehammer? Is it the little finished hammer? What is it you want to do, Lord? I'll do whatever you want to do. How do we pursue that, right? That's, that's where we began our talk today. It's like Paul says, I want you to pursue to be a man like that. Consider these thoughts of what power under control looks like. These three things, brothers. Power under control is a man who's humbled before God. Humbled before God. Every one of us have been goaded by God to submit and be knocked off our high horse. We probably in this room have multiple testimonies of how God has done just that very very thing. Secondly, submissive to the word of God. A man who's going to walk in self-mastery and the ability to have harnessed power for the glory of God and not the glory of man is going to be a man who says, like Saul, you are the word of God. What do you say? Ananias, at your word. Whatever you say, Lord, I trust you. And thirdly, a motivating factor of power and control is considerate with love for others. Why am I doing this? Why am I not doing this? Why am I saying this? How am I saying this? Is this is what they need? Have I prayed and asked God like Ananias? So, Lord, you want me to go and you want me to do this? And you, you don't want me to smack him. You, you want me to lay my hand upon him because your hand is gentle, Lord. So you want me to be, and you want me to pray that, and you want this particular gift of sight to be given to him. And then you want me to host him. This is what you want me to do, Lord. That's what a man who walks in meekness, he takes his directives from God, how he represents God. It, you might be comfortable with it, or like Jonah, you might be uncomfortable with it. I don't want to go to Nineveh. I don't like what's going to happen here. It's not about what we like. I've been crucified with Christ. I no longer live. It's whatever you want, Lord. We're going to break into some groups today, brothers, and I'm going to ask you to have a heart search. Search my heart. Test my thoughts. Kind of have a spiritual MRI, if you would, that God looks below the surface and we're transparent with one another with these questions. One, how has God humbled me? Brothers, Share your road to Damascus story because you might need to. You might have forgotten it. Sometimes we get knocked off our high horse only to go find a different horse and get back up on it. Secondly, how am I submitting to his word? Third, how am I gentle or meek with my family? And lastly, what's my prayer? What am I asking God? Father God, we come before you as your sons and we ask, Holy Spirit, that you would lead us as we come together and we fellowship with you in our midst. Spirit of the living God, speak to your sons. We want to be more like Jesus. And everyone said, amen. 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 Brothers, let's bake up in those groups and let's have some fellowship. All right, brothers, let's pray. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your presence in this place. We thank you for meeting us here. You always do. And we ask, Lord, in these last few minutes we have together that you would just tie everything together in a way that gives us direction and purpose and peace. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Have a seat, guys. Give me just two minutes. 
I want to work backwards here with these questions. And uh, I, I was pondering on, um, did you guys have a good group? Amen. Yeah, yeah, fellowship, right? So good, so good. Um, the group I was able to be part of at one point, we were just talking about, you know, all the different areas of, uh, you know, being um, a son, um, an ambassador in heaven, a, um, a father, um, a dad, a friend, and just all the areas that you're going, okay, is it, is it the rushing wind? Is it the quiet whisper? You know, both are gentle, both are meek, but in each situation, um, you can find yourself being a male Martha, just busy, 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 and troubled because you don't know how to apply um, distribute harness power in this particular situation. It's enough to drive you out of your mind if you let it, instead of seeking first his kingdom. Instead of first just going, I'm so daily aligned and walking in daily repentance before you, daily submitted to God, to when the situation comes, Christ flows. You with me? Amen. It's just, don't, don't worry about each situation, how you apply the power and mantle authority, the knowledge. Um, be more concerned whether you're submitted to God in every moment. And if you're submitted to God, the wind or the whisper will come according to his character and his heart and his love for the person in the situation. Um, we shouldn't stress about it. Um, if you do that, you'll, you'll be stressed and frustrated and you'll give the person you. You might use a Bible verse, but it'll be you. And it won't bear fruit to last. Amen? So I started thinking about Moses, the meekest man in all the earth, who man carried an incredible man of, of authority and power, did he not? And I thought about, well, what would his prayer be? And um, it says that Moses and the children of Israel, he laid them in a, led them in a song. He says, I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. He, God has done it. I couldn't do anything. I couldn't move this mountain to my right or my left. The Red Sea behind me or the army. God had to part the Red Sea. God has triumphed gloriously. He is the one who will do this, not me. I am yielding to him. That should be our prayer every day. Lord, I submit to you. What do you want, Lord? What, do you just say that out loud? What do you want, Lord? Yes, amen. So when I think about that being his prayer, I think about, well, what did Moses go through to become the meekest man? How did God humble him? He stripped him of everything. Stripped him. He went from prince in Egypt to about to become Pharaoh, next in line to be Pharaoh, to where now he's a wanted criminal, a murderer. And he goes from being a prince to a pauper. God humbled him. You'll never become meek without God breaking you. And he'll do it over and over again. God broke him. How did Moses submit to the word? Well, it was 40 years later after being broken that the burning bush came into play. And he saw, I'm, I see this great sight, and I'm going to go see what this is about. I'm seeking the Lord. But God was drawing him. And he submitted himself to the word of God, did he not? Do you think it was easy for Moses to go back into Egypt? It was not. He didn't want to speak. He wanted Aaron to do it. He had resistance with God. So do we. Good thing God is gentle and gives us what we need to take us where we need to go. Amen? Amen. And sometimes it takes years, oh, decades. It takes a long time. It did for Moses, and he was the meekest man on the earth. Don't be discouraged, brothers. God's working, right? But I'm sure he had to ponder for 40 years on how he had been humbled and stripped. To be a shepherd for an Egyptian was equivalent to emptying, emptying septic tanks. No exaggeration. It was very humbling. But he submitted himself to it. He didn't try and make a way back or a coup back to take over authority in Egypt. He left, he left it behind, forgetting what was behind, pressing forward what Christ had for him, right? Oh my gosh. And the thing is, he had difficulties submitting to the word how could he operate in that meekness and that power with his family? He had ups and downs like you and me. We think of the story where he married a Cushite woman. That's what Miriam and Aaron rebuked him for. Not that he wasn't permitted to do so, but they were prejudiced. 
for a variety of reasons. And there were problems that they foresaw that were true. She called circumcision a barbaric practice and would not permit Moses to circumcise his sons. Moses was not submitting to the word. He had been humbled and he submitted to the word to go down the road to stop submitting to the word because he wanted to be sensitive to his wife. He wanted to honor his wife. He wanted to be, maybe in his mind, gentle with his wife. What he should have done at that moment is says, honey, I understand. I understand this doesn't make sense to you. I understand this is scary to you and, and abhorrent to you. I, I, I'm sensitive that I get it. But I have to choose God over you. And maybe you don't trust God. Maybe you do. Trust me. Maybe you don't. But we have to move forward because this is the word of God. And as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That's what he should have done. And he didn't. God almost killed him. See, God can humble you and bring you to a place of submission to his word, but then you get comfortable. And then all of a sudden the wife starts to wear the pants in the family. And you go passive aggressive. You become an Ahab. There's the old saying, you're the head, but she's the neck and she turns you. That's not the order of things. A man needs to be meek, harnessed power, motivated in love, not in fear, not in control, but to represent Christ. But don't let that be a smokescreen for not taking a stand that costs you something. What does it cost you? A sense of support, respect, love. It's hard for us as men to take a stand with circumcision in our home, something that cuts, something that removes something. It's difficult, and we know if we do it, we're going to lose, lose affection and the seeming of accolades of those that we love and provide for. That is a test. Don't fail the test. Continue to prostrate yourself before God. Humble yourself, because if you don't, he'll humble you. And it's easy to humble yourself by just remembering all the times he's already humbled you. And trust his word over your feelings and the consequences of obeying his word. And God will be faithful. And then your prayer, instead of it being constant repentance of a circle of sin, it can be, Lord, you have triumphed gloriously. The horse and the rider have been thrown into the sea. And as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Father God, we thank you for your word that is true. We thank you for the gift of your Holy Spirit. We thank you, God, that you've given us power and the ability to harness that power for your glory. God, we submit ourselves to you, mind, body, and spirit. And we ask, God, for you to be glorified in our lives, through our lives, in our homes, in our workplace. God, we want to be a light that moves darkness. And it's in Jesus' name we pray and everyone said. Amen. God bless you, brothers.